did have something. Oh, let me go ahead and record it. Got it. <laughs> Everyone approved that recording. Um, all right, welcome guys to tonight's event for this meet and greet for a deaf professional. Uh, the, typically we have one, but tonight is a special experience. We have two guests um, and they're gonna talk about their traveling experiences and seeing the world as a deaf individuals. Um, so before we actually get going, we do wanna remind everyone to please make sure to keep your videos off um, and muted while we are doing this interview and story time discussion. Um, and then kind of towards the end, we will have some Q&A time, questions and answers. Um, and during that time, um, you know, you guys can turn your cameras on, but we're gonna go ahead and hold that until the end. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I'm honored to introduce our two guests. If you guys wanna introduce yourselves and talk about your names, where you're from and whatnot, you can go ahead and get started. Hi guys, my name is Shana Unger. My sign name is an S and an R on my uh, arm here because my middle name is Rose. And I'm Scott, this is my name sign here. Um, some of you are wondering, yes, we are together. We are girlfriend, boyfriend, almost 10 years now. So, yep. yes, we that are. Yes, long time. Long time. <laughs> So we'll go ahead and talk about our background, kind of how we grew up or what our family looks like. Um, we were born deaf and we're from a, I'm from a, a fully deaf family with brothers and sisters. Um, and so we are full deaf families. Um, we both went to deaf schools and deaf university. And so completely in, involved in the deaf world and stuff still in that deaf world. Um, so we are really here to talk about our traveling because that is something that we love to do. We love going on different adventures and, you know, um, you know, seeing backcountry hikes and mountain climbing and kayaking adventures and all kinds of different things, just kind of going out and doing all the things that we like to do. So that is our dream. And that's something that we've always loved to do. And so we've been doing that together for about 10 years and just traveling. Now, amongst our travels and everything, we also work full time, understand. I work as a math teacher at the School for the Deaf. And I'm a school counselor for the School for the Deaf. So that is kind of just a little bit about us, um, you know, kind of before we start our actual story time about our adventures. Okay, now to get a better picture of us, um, as a teacher, I love telling stories to my students and, you know, getting them really engrossed in what I'm talking about. So my whole purpose of doing that is for them to find meaning in my story that I share with them. So I am posing this challenge to you all to be able to find the meaning in the stories that we are sharing with you tonight. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, I will start. Um, when I was about, say, three, four years old, um, I realized my parents were deaf, you know, and they used ASF the entire time. And I was like, huh, okay. They didn't use their voices at all. They didn't speak. Um, they didn't use hearing aids, cochlear implants, nothing like that. They just used sign language, you know, all my life. And my parents loved taking out a book and signing the book to me. And it was just fascinating. That's how they read stories to me. So that really created my love for stories. And I wanted to become a fireman. And my parents were like, sure, you can do it. I was like, really? I can? And that was it. I was so excited all starting when I was five years old till I don't know, seven, eight. And I'd wear fireman's outfits, all kinds of stuff. And then I was like seven or eight. And I'm like, you know what? I want to be a doctor now. And my folks were like, sure. If that's what you want, do it. I was like, really? I was like, okay, eight years old. I'm like, all right, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. And then when I was like a uh, teenager, about 12, 13 ish, I was like, eh, that's old, you know? And I, my eye got drawn to, you know, those old fashioned globes on a stand and you could spin it. And I was like, oh, look at this, look at this. There are all these different places in the world. And I'm like, mom, I want to go over here. And she's like, sure, why not do it? 
was like, really? I can't, well, how, how can I get across all that water? Mom's like, get on a plane. You fly over there. Well, how does it, how does that work? Well, you buy a plane ticket and you fly around. Really? Yeah, you can do that. I can. Then when I was like 14, I wanted to go and see, oh, I wanted to be an explorer and explore the whole world. And they're like, go for it. So when I was 18 and I graduated high school, I got together with some friends and I'm like, okay, let's do this, that, and the other. And we were talking about, all right, let's bike, riding our bicycles from the East coast where I grew up all the way out to the West coast. And I was like, all right, let me check in with the folks and see what they say about this. And I'm like, they'll probably be like, dude, you're crazy. You're stupid or something, you know, or I'm an idiot, whatever, you know? So I was like, ah, hey, mom, dad, you know, I was nervous. I, I'll admit I was nervous. I'm like, look, I want to ride my bike across, you know, East coast to West coast across America, 18 years old. And guess what my folks said? They were like, go for it. You can do it. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, do it. And I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's bike across America. It took me 60 days with two other friends. So the three of us got on our bikes and biked from the East coast to the West coast and actually did it. And that started the seed for my world travels. So next adventure, I was 19. I had me and my five friends, we got together and we decided, you know, let's go to the most difficult, dangerous areas in the world. And it's like, okay, why don't we try this? Let's buy a sailboat and just set sail. Let's just do it from Maryland to Florida. Let's start out that way. And so we talked about it and I'm like, I don't know. Should I ask my folks for permission? Well, I'm 19. I think I can do this. I really, I'm not going to even bother. So that's when I finally started seeing the other side. Now, one of my five friends, his family told him, no, you can't, you're deaf. How are you going to be able to communicate? And it's really dangerous. There's no radio you know, because you can't hear and all this stuff and really enforcing that he had a disability, therefore couldn't do things. And I was like, oh, oh, wait a minute. I have the same disability that does that mean I can't do this, that and the other. And I walked up to my folks and I'm like, wait a minute. I don't think I can do all this stuff because of this, that and the other. And my parents looked at me and they're like, find a way find a way. I was like, oh, find a way. Okay. You know what? They're right. I may be disabled in the fact that I can't hear, you know, and that is an obstacle for me, but in the real world, everyone, yeah, they do speak. They'll, you know, we're kidding ourselves if we say, no, I'm fine. I'm fine as a deaf person. No, no. There are times that we have obstacles that we need to find a way to overcome. And that's a fact of life. And it's like, okay, see the light there. And, you know, growing up being told, I can, I can, I can, I can. And then all of a sudden being said, yeah, you do have a disability. Regardless, you can find a way. You know, buy tickets, get on that boat and go ahead, set sail, go on down. And I did it. It was you a epic it. trip. We totally made it. Just the five of us. We have never owned a boat before. <laughs> nothing like that we did we set sail hit ground at florida and we're like whoa i mean we surprised ourselves to be honest we really did and then after that experience i really started to develop a strong internal belief that regardless of being deaf we can do anything you know and that really took root starting when i was four and then shana and i met and we realized we have the same passion you know, we love to explore the world and we're like, okay, let's plan a trip from the bottom to the top of Africa. And we did, we, it took us six months to travel and it's like, let's do this together. It's like, and we didn't need to ask anybody for permission. We didn't need to be like, can I do this? Should I do this? What if, but our disabilities, nothing. We just looked at one another. And we're like, let's do it. You know, so going from home to asking our parents 
what, you know, permission and all that, that really built the self-esteem and confidence needed to be able to do these kind of things. And we, from the bottom of Africa, all the way to the top, to Cairo, Egypt, we went to the pyramids and everything. It, I mean, the world is out there and anything and everything is possible if you have enough self-belief. And our passions have changed over the years. And now our new hobbies are rock climbing and mountain climbing. And we're like, okay, let's try to climb the tallest mountain in North. Hold on a moment. That's what I thought you said. Okay. Okay, so we decided to climb the highest mountain in North America, which is Denali Mountain. And we never once took a step back to go, should we ask our folks? Nothing. We just went ahead and planned it and went. And so, you know, there, yes, there are still obstacles. There are still people that have doubt. And people are like, oh, gosh, are you sure? Because you're deaf. How are you going to be able to communicate? How are you going to be able to do that? It's like, look. It's always going to be that way for the rest of our lives. That's a matter of fact, and it's not going to change. What does change is our perspective and our approach and how to deal with that. And we made it. We became the first completely deaf team to reach the top of Mount Denali and came back down. And it was such a wonderful feeling. Again, I'm emphasizing this started from when I was four years old. You know, so we were sitting there at the dining room table, you know, and it's still the same dining room table I sat at at four. And I'm a little embarrassed to say, but, you know, that light, you know, that hangs, you know, the chandelier in the dining room, the dining room light there above the table. It's the same one <laughs> since I was four. You know, that dining room, it's still set in the 90s. It, nothing's changed. My parents love the house. And it's like, you got to respect that. So sitting there at the dining room table. My mom's on one end, my dad's on the other. And we're all sitting there. This is just like not long ago at all. And I told my folks, I was like, you know, I think we're going to go ahead and try climbing the tallest mountain in the world. Maybe Mount Everest. I think we're going to take a shot at it. And guess what my folks said? They looked at me and they were like, hey, man, you can. I'm like, all right, not a bad goal for our next trip. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> So, you know, that really sums up our journey from, you know, from my aspect from beginning to end. I saw a lot going on in the chat, um, but, you know, a big point of the story of about why he was really telling this whole story, or do you guys have any, you know, comments about this story or anything that you guys want to kind of feedback on? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. Go ahead. I'm pulling it up so I can see what you all are writing. Brielle says, you guys are being quiet. Come on. You like challenges. Yes. Like challenges. Yeah. That's a good one. No barriers to what you can do. Yep. More. Any more thoughts, feedback, comments? You can accomplish anything, no matter your disability. Yeah, absolutely. Any last entries kind of thing? Any last thing anybody wants to say? I'll give you 15 seconds. Come on, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, oh. Oh, somebody's asking the next oh, mountain. Hold on. on. <laughs> oh, okay, let me ask, answer that one. Okay. Let me see here. Oh, oh, okay. Another good question. Oh, what? You want to take it? Uh, to prove yourself uh, to nobody else. To prove yourself and no one else. Yeah, good. Good points y'all are throwing in there. I pre appreciate it. Now, one thing I'd like to go ahead and put out there with y'all. I, When I was born, uh, never did I once think I was deaf. You know, I never knew what kind of barriers would be out there or obstacles to any opportunities. I never thought that way. 
my folks believed in me and that's all I really knew. You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe my folks had doubt in their mind, but they didn't want to put that out there. They were just like, you got this, you got this. So I really use that to navigate my entire life. I fully, truly believed I could be a fireman or a doctor. Even if I asked my folks saying I wanted to be a president, you know, of the United States, my folks probably say, do it, you can. So if you have kids, if you're gonna have kids, regardless of how old they are, the whole point I'm trying to share is please be encouraging to them and let them pursue their dreams and passions. And you know it's going to change over time. But the important thing is, as parents, you believing in your children is going to be an enormous source of support for them. Maybe they want to be a musician or a dancer. What have you, maybe a painter, an artist. You know, really the whole point is give them your support and just believing in them. And then the sky's the limit for them. And building that foundation painting that foundation for them to believe in themselves and give them confidence that they can do that and instill that in them forever until they hit those barriers and realize, you know, they can't, but they can figure out how to find another way to overcome those obstacles. They have to be able to believe in themselves to do that and figure out how to overcome and get over or around those obstacles. And they can believe and do whatever they can and want to do really a child or anyone. And Briella is saying, yes. And just to clarify something, just because, you know, we need, as parents, you need to make sure that you're supporting your kids. Sorry, my cat. (laughs) Um, Because you guys are parents, you need to make sure that you're supporting and instilling that confidence. It is important to make sure that we're doing that. We We want the kids to make sure that they know that their obstacles are there, but that's not something that can stop you they have to push through and overcome them. The, over, the obstacles can't just be something that they're stuck with. So parents, parent support is really, you know, in, is really important. And uh, you guys as an audience, we, need to, we want to try to instill that in you, to try to overcome that thinking. Because it is important to believe that everyone can overcome and be successful. And not just regarding the children, but also professionals too. The professionals who are working with the deaf kids. You know, we want everyone to encourage that, that confidence and instill that confidence in them because, you know, they need to make sure that we're in, that, you know, everyone that's involved has that. And it, that's the key to it. And to add to that, <clears throat> we both work in school settings. And we've seen many times, like kids will come up to me and say, hey, I I, want to be an actor in the movies. And I'm like, yeah, you can totally do that. And the minute I say that to that kid, I can see his eyes glow because all of a sudden somebody believes in him. You know, maybe 10 years from now, he's not going to be interested in acting. And that's not the point. The point is to be able to give that kid that opportunity to glow within because I actually believe in him. You know, not just giving him lip service, but truly saying and meaning, you can do this. I believe in you. Oh, hold on. Now, the second thing I, I, I'd like to say, if you don't mind, is now we're both born in the 90s. So for deaf people in the 90s compared to nowadays, it's totally different. I mean, we never thought we would have as much accessibility, interpreting services, video relay services, video phones, text messaging, even being able to do video calls on the phone, voice to text, translation apps, you know, what else? Uh, Even just climbing mountains before we never thought we could do that. (laughs) Um, But, you know, that's a different kind of a thing, but, you know, even being able to, you know, have text messages while we're climbing mountains rather than having to rely on a radio. Right. So being born in the 90s, you know, some of the job opportunities were not even possible for us. And now 20 years after the fact, it is possible. Like she was saying, rock climbing. 20 years ago, you had to have a radio. If you did not, you were not allowed to go up. 
Well, now we have our phones with the GPS built in and all that stuff. So that technology allows our dreams to be realities. So for your children, they are so fortunate. Here we are in 2022. Oh my God, what is it going to be like in 20, 30 years now? It's mind blowing how much more opportunities will present themselves for them. You know, it's going to be huge. So don't look at it as just right now. They can't do a particular career or job. Think of it in 20 years, what the opportunity would be for that child for the same kind of career and opportunity they want. And I was just thinking, you know, how, you know, deaf people now in the medical community were, you know, even just using like stethoscopes. I don't know how to spell it, but stethoscopes, <laughs> just to hear the heartbeat, you know, that's something that you have to rely on hearing. But nowadays, there's an invention that you can see the heartbeat rather than hearing it. So it's more of a visual stethoscope, you know, and that wasn't something that, you know, doctors could ever use. And it's something just basic that doctors have to have. But now deaf people are able to become doctors because they can use that type of technology. And I love that point that you just said. Okay, guys, um, do you have anything, any last things that you want to add before we do the Q&A? Well, Shana, you want to talk about this? Okay, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> um, I think that representation in the community is really important. You know, it seems like for a long time, there wasn't a ton of representation. Um, and, you know, maybe your area, there isn't a ton yet. But we want people to, you know, be representation. And in the past, there was nobody in the deaf community climbing mountains. And it was something that we had to ourselves figure out how to, you know, do. And we had to write back and forth and figure things out. And then, you know, we had to So we had to so we had to use crampons to be able to um climb the mountain. And you know, that wasn't something that we could do the phone. It's, it's just giving me a lot of feedback. Okay. Okay. That's better. Sorry. <laughs> Technology problem. <laughs> okay. So in the past, you know, we didn't know how to put on crampons when we were first starting out. And so we had to kind of learn along the way. And that's something, you know, when we got done mountain climbing, we came back and we were able to teach people how to do that using ASL. That way other people knew how to use it. And they didn't have to have that struggle. And so, you know, they didn't have to go through that whole thing. And so now they're able to just go ahead and put on the crampons without having to figure it out themselves and write back and forth and ask, pe ask other people. And so now it's already signed and ready for people to learn. And, you know, representation is key. And maybe right now representation isn't everywhere, but in the future, it's something that we can have more of. That way, kids know that representation is out there. And if there's something your kid's involved in, you can look on YouTube in different areas to see, and it could be insp inspiring for them too. And it's a good opportunity, a good way to encourage your kid. And maybe somebody in our audience has a kid that will be the first deaf person um, in space, you know? Yes. Oh, fingers crossed. That would be or cool. the first deaf president or you never know. I mean, anything is possible. It's endless, you know, as long as you believe it. And that's the point of their, their stories, you know, that you can do it if you believe in yourself. So that's my big takeaway from tonight. You know, um, I can do it. We can do it. Exactly. All right, guys, I think now's a good time to go ahead and transfer over or transition over, excuse me, to the Q&A. Um, so we're going to prioritize families first for asking questions. So those of you who are family members, um, you can go ahead and ask questions. Um, we're going to go ahead and do that. And then once we're done with family members asking questions, we can have other professionals to ask questions. So if we don't mind having family members first, um, you're more than welcome to turn on your cameras. You can use your voice. You can 
type something in the chat, either way, whatever you prefer. Also, you're more than welcome to use the raise your hand option. Um, and if I see that your hand is raised on your video, I can go ahead and use that. And that way I can see you and we can pull you up and make sure that you're acknowledged. I see two questions, but they're from earlier. Oh, right. One person named Amanda asked, what is the next mountain that you guys plan to climb? Oh, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about it. You know, it's the same at the same dining room table I was telling you all about with that light over it and all that. We're thinking maybe a Mount Everest. I don't know, maybe another one. We're not sure yet. It will announce it though. TBA, how's that? We have Instagram and we'll announce it through Instagram maybe in about a month or so. Keep an eye out. Maybe you guys can share your Instagram accounts, uh, your tags, your handle, if you don't mind in the chat, and then people can follow you and kind of keep you updated to see what you guys are up to next, what, what your next adventures are. There was another question in there. Yes. Where do you guys teach? We teach at MSD, uh, Maryland School for the Deaf. He's in middle school and I'm in a counselor in elementary school. Any other parents that have any other questions? You know, somebody said something about you speak well. Oh. They said to ignore that one. Oh, we can ignore it. <clears throat> Amanda had a question and said, what is your biggest obstacle um, while being deaf? Um, well, I think the biggest obstacle that I experienced for myself personally, I mean, Shana may have something different. Whenever I've met a hearing person, <clears throat> I do not speak well. Honestly, I cannot speak. If you ask me to say something, I'll, it, it'll be embarrassing. Yeah, I sign at least 10 times better than I speak. And also I cannot hear. I don't use hearing aids or anything. So it's very difficult for me to initiate conversation with somebody that can hear. And the minute I approach somebody that can hear and I let them know I can't do this and this, their automatic reaction is I'm not that intelligent. Um, maybe I'm developmentally delayed, you know, and so I have to start from rock bottom with them and work my way up. <clears throat> so I use my phone with the texting stuff. And, and so to, to show that I have good English to reflect my intelligence even though it really shouldn't be that way. I mean, I don't naturally feel that way because they can't communicate with me in my language. It's now my fault and I have to use their language to communicate with them. It's a source of <laughs> quite a bit of frustration. It, it doesn't matter if I'm traveling, if I'm in the mountains, regardless of the environment. And I feel like we have to study harder before you know, even before we're advent going on any kind of adventure, we have to, you know, talk to a park ranger or, you know, someone that is there, you know, we, we feel like we have to study harder and know all of the jargon and lingo beforehand, just because, you know, we're deaf, people think we can't, you know, and it's, it, again, makes it a bigger obstacle and they're worried about us. And so we have to explain that we know where we're going. We have a plan set and we kind of explain everything more in depth. And then they tend to feel a little bit more comfortable. They think, oh, we have the right equipment. Oh, you know, we have the permits, we have everything. So we have to kind of study and prepare harder beforehand, even though, you know, other people might come up and just, you know, park rangers might say, sure, go ahead. But we have to do double the work and it's pretty frustrating. Exactly. And that's why I, I'm trying to stress that it is really important to really plant and nurture that seed of self-confidence with kids because they are going to have to do that and work twice as hard. And if they don't have that kind of foundation instilled in them, they're going to feel easily defeated. And, and, and you know what? That's just not the goal, right? 
And, you know, we have um, a story, you know, talking about in Alaska and, you know, people say, you know, oh, we've, we've struggled so hard, da, da, da. but I'm like, no, 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 you know, if, if we want to do a last minute um, trip, you know, to take a trip to go and do something, um, you know, we can just say, oh, we've got a GPS, we can go ahead and do it and pull it up and you know that makes it much easier nowadays but you know people think oh okay i didn't realize that you could you know go ahead and do those things and be make it so easy you have proof now that that's fine you can do it but you know it's again it's important to instill that confidence that's the key which made renting the kayak that much more of a challenge and afterwards he realized and was happy to rent to us again <clears throat> Brilla is asking, what is the biggest triumph and struggle that you guys have with the kayaks? Um, I know climbing. that. Sorry, I got lost there. That's okay. In climbing Mount Denali, what were some of your biggest triumphs and some of your struggles? Um, probably, you know, as being the, um, the team that got to the top with my, with my brother included, um, you know, we assumed that we would have a hearing guide. People assumed that we would have somebody there to guide us up to the mountain. Um, you know, but we were doing this on our own and, you know, that I felt like, you know, who, oh, wow, we can do it. We can get up there. Um, and, you know, afterwards we went, um, to, a deaf school and we talked to, you know, a class and they thought, oh my gosh, you're deaf. You're the same as us. We can get to the top of a mountain, you know? And so we tried to encourage those kids to do that too. And, you know, that was probably the best part, you know, just watching the kids faces thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm deaf too. I can do that too. Exactly. Yeah. We, you know, we've talked about this off, often, which is better reaching the top or seeing these kids at that school for the deaf in Alaska being like, oh, you know, because that inspired feeling is, is the same. It's the same. Right. And what do you think a challenge or a struggle is? I was thinking probably the planning and getting all of the information because sometimes there's not enough of it. Yeah, exactly. Like when we were doing the planning, you know, a lot of the doubts creep in. Like, can we really do this? It's going to be dangerous, you know? And yeah, and it really made us question ourselves in some ways, to be honest. It really did. And, and that is challenging. That was challenging. Access to information, too, is a big one. You know, making sure that we have the, our language, um, you know, that's a big challenging part, making sure that we have access in our own language. Excuse me. And your son can climb a mountain, too, you know? Your kids can do it, too. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, are there any other parents that have any other questions? If not, we'll go ahead and shift over and open the floor to any professionals that have any questions. If you guys want to use um, open up your screen and open up your video, um, go ahead and raise your hand. That way I can kind of make a line, a cue. Okay, great. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, when you were biking from the East Coast to the West Coast, Scott, what surprised you during that journey? And what, what did you learn from it? Okay. All right. Um, so biking from East Coast to West Coast, I think uh, it was 14 years ago now. Gosh, that was a long time. All right. That was my first trip. Oh, you were such a baby. Yeah. Okay. I remember from start to finish, the biggest thing for me was realizing how beautiful this country is and how giving people are. You know, often, you know, I would, you see somebody in a situation like, you know, a person got a flat tire, you know, on the side of the road there, you think, oh God, my life's over right? It's like, what am I going to do with this flat? And it happened to me that my bike got a flat. And all of a sudden, like two or three different people pulled over, like, do you need help? You want me to take you to a local bike shop? It didn't matter that I couldn't hear. 
they saw that I was a human being in need and they pulled over and were more than willing to help. So that was really just, that's beautiful. You know, how beautiful this country is and the people here are. You know, that was a huge takeaway for me for this trip that I did. Now, further along the line, you know, I was like, I see people on the side of the road, they need help. I'm like, all right, I'll go ahead and pay it forward. You know what I'm saying? And help them out, do them a favor. So that's what that instilled in me. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. All right, next person, anyone else have a question? I did see somebody kind of pull up and then pull their screen off again. There is a question in the chat. It says, how do you adapt to signing while um, mountain climbing? You wanna take it? Uh, oh, okay, I'll do it. Okay, great question. Um, we adapt as we go, <laughs> you know? Um, we, we had no one to turn to to ask advice for, you know, how, do we, how, how should we do this? How did you do this? There was nobody out there to, to tell us, no other deaf person. So, you know, you got to see whoever. Okay. So what we did is she would be up higher and I'd be lower, but like, how do we communicate? You know, it's a dangerous situation. We're on the side of a cliff, literally. You know, and we did, we sat down and talked about it beforehand. Like, I don't know. Okay, so we practiced. We went to different places and developed our own techniques on how to do stuff. So with the rope, you know, that you're rappelling with to help, we'll tap on the, the uh, rock face about three times. So your partner will feel that. They know to stop and look. You say what you got to say, check in, we're good to go, and then go. And then if something happens again, you wrap that rope three times again on the cliff face and they look and people were like, dude, never saw anything like that before. Wow. So whereas people that can hear will be shouting, hey, 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 left, right, you know, and it, no, we use the rope. I do remember one challenge, you know, um, if one person was, you know, maybe falling and pulled the rope, you know, hearing people would be able to yell fall and then we would be able to stop and, you know, hearing people can stop and know what's going on. But we, you know, basically didn't realize it. And so as we were going, you know, we kind of just tried our best and kind of worked through it. Yeah. You know, we, we're not going to sit here and, and, you know, blow smoke and lie and say everything was roses because it wasn't, it wasn't perfect. There were some disadvantages. And in some cases we had to work two, three times harder than normal, you know? Yep. Yeah, we did. We found a way. And, you know, there are different challenges um, and you just kind of have to be creative. As deaf people, we typically are creative because of those different obstacles that we face. We kind of have to figure out our own ways to get around them, you know, and yeah. just overcome them. <laughs> we have to be creative with, you know, ourselves in our community and figure out, you know, no matter what our background is, it's just one thing that I can say about deaf people in general, we are really creative and motivated at figuring things out and de we're determined. Right. And maybe and one other thing I'd like to add <clears throat> for your parents or whomever is dealing with the kids, you know, often, you know, it's controversial conversations regarding being able to hear, signing, cochlear implant, hearing aids, different forms of hearing, speech, all that jazz. Yes, that is important to determine which path is, you know, best for your child to pursue. But honestly, kind of think beyond that too, in building the foundation, you know, what's important for your child to feel fulfilled, complete, a whole person, confident, and building that up for them, I think is more important, honestly. Because, you know, maybe speech won't work out for them and you got to shift over to signing. Maybe that's not going to work out for them and you got to shift over to a mod another modality. As long as they're a complete whole person, they'll be able to figure a way to access life. You know, should they have a cochlear implant? Should they use bilats? <clears throat> you know, there are different options out there, as you all know. But the key thing is, is to have a whole child. And self-esteem is key. 
I see one person had raised their hand. I believe it was Jenny. If you want to um, open up your video and come on, that's more than welcome. Hey, hi. Hello. <laughs> this is my son. Um, we had missed in the beginning. Sorry, he's a little shy and doesn't want to sign, but. <laughs> Um, we were just curious, um, with your passion and motivation wanting to mountain climb, where did that come from? And well, also, first, I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your story. We were completely amazed, you know, having deaf parents and everything, you know, it's just, it's amazing. So how did you guys get that passion? Where did it come from? <laughs> this is his famous story. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> That really started um, when I was saying I saw that glow, you know, you know, kids tend to have one particular thing they're really drawn to, right? For me, it was that glow. And I would just, I couldn't let it go. You know, it's like, where does the ocean end? Wait a minute, why is it like this? Why are the lands shaped like this? Why, why is it positioned this way? You know, so I was completely enraptured with that. And to this day, I'm just, I love all things due to the globe, you know, with rock climbing, mountain climbing, how that started, really, I think I was about 22. I never once went up a mountain. I hadn't, I had, I had zero experience. I just one day looked at the mountain and I was like, man, that's really pretty. Why don't I get on up there? What, what does it look like up there, you know? And this was in 2010. You know, we didn't have Google Earth and all that then, and you could see everything from any aspect. So I was like, I mean, that looks good to me. Why don't I try it? And a lot of trial and error, lots of error in the trial and error, I will admit, uh, like a thousand mistakes. But the one thing I was really thankful for were my parents. They never once turned to me and go, man, that's so silly. You're so stupid. Stop. Never criticized. They were like, okay, that happened. That was a mistake. Try something else and keep going. You know, learn from it. It's the only way you can learn. Okay. Made another mistake. Another lesson learned. So it was that kind of mindset they really instilled in me. Right. Yeah. It took me almost, I think, ten, nine or 10 years to finally get to the top of Mount Denali. Oh, that was fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, it wasn't overnight, man. It was not no. overnight. So nine years from when I looked at the mountain and wanted to go up there. Now, I saw a six-year-old boy who was more skilled at this than me because his dad's sitting there talking him through how to do all the stuff, you know, with the safety measures and everything. It was like, it took me forever. But now if my kid were to do it, it'd be a snap for him. Right. It would shorten the length of time. Exactly. Because I could explain it. Wow. You're never too old, right? You said 22 years old. So you're never too old. Right. So I was 22. Now I'm 32. So 10 years. Yeah. And I became a school teacher because that's all I knew, you know? There, most of the deaf representation I saw were of deaf teachers. Never saw a deaf mountain climber. Maybe if I saw a mountain climber that was deaf when I was 15 or 16, I may have started much younger. You know what I'm right. saying? Thank you for your question. That was a great question. Whatever the passion is, I'm talking to you, to you in the back. <laughs> Whatever your passion is, you can do it. Just chase it, right? Thank you for asking your question. <clears throat> All right, if there's any other people that have some questions, go ahead, raise your hand, pull your screen up, open your video up. Oh, there's somebody that just wrote in the chat. It was Connie. She said, are you going to do a supported climb of Mount Everest with base tents, Sherpa support, et cetera, or totally on your own? You take this one. 
So with Mount Everest, um, you do require a PAL, um, which is a guide or a support team. Um, and so you do, that is part of the permit. You do have to do that. So we would like to do it on our own, but some mountains do require having that. And so Mount Everest is one of those. And so we will have a team with a full supported team um, to bring us up the mountain. Yeah. And to um, the permit aspect, it's really difficult to get one. Um, Often teams have, like you said, a Sherpa who will carry things, set up the base tent and all that. Um, within that, it's permit ready. Now, one permit costs about $25,000. Yeah, just for the permit. Now, for the support, the base camp, all that, that's about fifty to 60000 for one person. <laughs> so... Yeah, it seems simple, you know, go climb a mountain, no big deal, but whew, it costs a lot of money, requires a team, permits, training, trainings, yeah, lots of preparation. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and on to Mount Everest there too, there's price tags per item, like per bottle of oxygen, that costs about $1,000 per canister. If you need two canisters, you know, that's two grand. I mean, it adds up quick, real quick. Wow, adds up. <laughs> All right. Well, we are almost at the end of tonight's event. So if there's any burning questions, now's the time. Nothing? Y'all y'all are good? Okay. All right. All guess right. not. If you guys have any final comments that you want to share with the parents or the professionals, anyone in the audience, um, if you guys want to share anything, go ahead. Um, well, I, I think we've hit on several really key things we wanted to share. Um, one thing I'd love for you to, to keep in mind is great if you were able to get one thing out of this. If it was two or three, even better. Um, you know, we're always available through our Instagram account. Please reach out. If you have any questions regarding traveling, mountain climbing, or anything that you think of later, we are happy to answer your questions. So, you know, we can give out our information with you guys, and we'd love to share it with the community. Yeah, I, you know, I would tell her when I sit here, I, I feel like I owe the deaf community, you know, that I'm going to owe the deaf community for the rest of my life because the deaf community has been so good to me. You know, so anytime I felt, you know, struggle or what have you, I've been able to turn to the deaf community and we want to be available to you all for that exact reason. People's comments are so wonderful. Everyone says, you know, thank you. I love your motivation, passion. Yes. So it's whatever you guys want for your future, for your deaf children, you guys can do it. You guys are all, you know, you guys can get on that level. You can do it. The sky is the limit. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you guys both so much for your time, your stories. And thank you to our two interpreters for voicing. I know that they had to move their eyes a lot and keep up with the conversation. So, um, and then thank you to you guys as the audience to, you know, your, for your involvement, your questions and everything. So hopefully you guys have a wonderful evening and, uh, you know, keep chasing your dreams and exploring. Thank you guys.